Um, I think the topics of conversation we have this week um, are all incredibly important, but the idea that we have to be sustainable um, within ourselves, with our organizations, and then with the environment around us. That's a very important thing to cover. Um, so I'll be um, asking the panel a few questions, but I will. I think that this is a great audience of experts, and I will be cold calling the audience, and we will be asking you questions. So uh, <laughs> get ready, everybody. Get ready to wake up and um, um, answer some questions. Um, so first... Um, I have all of your bios here. I, I know who has good answers. I know who hasn't spoken up yet um, at this summit. Uh, so we're going to do this. <laughs> um, I just want to challenge this audience. Um, so first, um, I'd like to um, ask uh, Paul and Bonnie um, some questions about uh, what they think um, in this space. So Bonnie, you know, you work in um, social entrepreneurship and social innovation. Uh, that's a field that's particularly notorious for driving burnout, social workers. Uh, the intersection of social workers and uh, tech and innovation workers, that just leads to a level of intensity. Um, what have you seen in the social e-environment? How do social entrepreneurs manage this pressure? Great. Um, I really like Norman's talk, uh, so thanks for that. Um, I think um, one one moment when I actually realised how deeply rooted this problem of burnout is among social entrepreneurs was uh, only earlier this year. I went to a retreat um, in China, and around 80% of the class have experienced burnout, um, and 50% of those have experienced depression as a result of the burnout. Um, that was a very sobering figure and experience for me because um, what is driving these social entrepreneurs is the urgency to want to help certain groups of people who haven't had the access in, in life, who haven't got the right opportunities, um, but at the same time, they are so driven by that and they constantly worry that they're not doing enough, that they can't be sleeping, they can't be taking a break because there are people who are suffering. So that, I think, is even more intense on an emotional level compared to perhaps what um, people are experiencing in Silicon Valley because it's something quite deeply rooted uh, in someone's heart. Um, so, but I think at the same time, I've seen social entrepreneurs get some of their inspirations and relief from actually engaging uh, to, your, to your leap, you know, really engaging with the people we are serving. Uh, and for me, um, I, I kind of run an organization that uh, works with a lot of marginalized women and girls across the world. Uh, and I remember this experience where I'm hearing from my team member in Kenya uh, about um, the Maasai women that we're working with. So the Maasai are a group of indigenous community uh, in parts of Kenya as well as uh, Tanzania. And she was sharing with me that their philosophy is not looking at the next year or the next three to five years, which a lot of businesses, whether it's a non-profit or for-profit, think about. Uh, they are really thinking about centuries and generations. Uh, and I think that kind of puts things into perspectives. I often get caught up in this hamster wheel and just thinking about the next day or the next three years, who's going to fund us, how much money we're going to make. Uh, but if you put things into perspective that this is really about the, this common planet that we live in and that there are cultures, I mean, back to really learning from other cultures and getting out of... Um, the, the norms and uh, values that perhaps we have been conditioned to grow up in, um, just really expanding our horizons. And I think this picture really sums it up quite well. You know, you're really expanding kind of your horizon and really thinking very far ahead and also extracting oneself from that bigger picture. I mean, knowing where you fit in, in that ecosystem, but it's not just about oneself, but really about the whole movement of people that you're bringing with you. Thank you. Um, so, Paul, um, you, and you know, you've been a repeat Silicon Valley entrepreneur, um, but with a good understanding of the Asian context. How would you describe? Uh, you know, Silicon Valley is a very specific bubble. Um, I also uh, lived and worked in this bubble. Um, what? How would you describe it to our audience? People who haven't worked in uh, tech companies here. What's unique about burnout in this setting? Yeah. Thanks, Steph. I think it's kind of funny that we've been invited. I guess as the expert panel here. 
Um, evidently, we're all very good at burnout. This is um, our expertise, yeah. something that we should not be terribly proud of. Um, but I'm actually quite keen to hear your burnout stories, because I'm sure that's going to be, uh, we'll get some diversity in the room um, about burnout. Um, in, in terms of the, the, I mean, the valley, the, the whole culture here, um, I mean, it's awesome for so many reasons. That's, you know, we talk about the unicorns, whatever. Um, but a lot of it is really anchored in this idea that you drive hard, you, uh, surround, like, you surround yourself with uh, top players. I think that was like in, in the bathrooms here. You know, you drive full speed ahead. I mean, and invariably this leads to burnout. The way I kind of look at burnout, I mean, just judging from, you know, the last couple of uh, burnout experiences I've had, <laughs> um, you know, I guess the first thing is that you don't, at least for me, often you don't really realize that you're burnt out until you're completely fried, you know? Um, and it's funny that because, you know, I think there's a lot of value in, and maybe we can open up the discussion in a minute, but just understanding what are those telltale signs of, you know, of burnout? I mean, I remember for my first startup, you know, every week was over 100 hour a week, um, wasn't sleeping very well. Uh, and, you know, the rare times I would sleep, I'd wake up with a sore jaw just from like grinding my teeth all, like, all night. Um, and it's just crazy because, you know, you think that this is, I'm just going to get past this one, this next hump. And then there's another, another hump. There's always going to be another, another hump. And then to, to your point, I thought it was quite interesting, like, you know, like uh, the idea of sustainability, your definition, Norman, of um, that it's like, when can you let go of the reins? And so, you know, at some point I just burnt out. I, I left the, the startup um, thinking I was going to be completely indispensable. And in actual fact, we're a lot more dispensable than you think. You know, I feel like, at least I was. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, I think you can get in your head that you're, that you're like super important and the, 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 you know, the companies or your organization is going to crumble without you. Um, but, you know, I think if you surrounded yourself with like capable people, they'll, they'll be really resourceful and they'll, they'll find a way to fill in the gaps where, you know, you're not able to. Um, yeah, I, I guess the other, the other experience, I mean, if it's interesting at all, um, so, so in, the, in the valley right now, uh, meditation has become the, you know, the new norm. Um, silent retreats is what everyone's doing. So, like, you know, just, just because I'm here, I ended up signing up for like a 10-day silent retreat as well. Um, and for me, that was like the, the, the telltale sign of burnout, where the entire 10 days, all I could do was think about work, um, which is not terribly meditative. And so... <laughs> So, I mean, I think, I think just to get back to your question, I mean, that's really, that's really it, isn't it? It's just like the, the culture. But now let's, like, let's try and find what those signs are so we can like, you know, have an intervention. Well, you know, that's address that topic of like, extreme work, right? Because like, uh, there's such a temptation to, to work hard if you're trying to do game-changing things. Um, and in China, there's this whole 996 work culture uh, where China's infamous for tech companies working uh, from nine to nine, six days a week. Um, and you have bosses who are 007 bosses because they work from noon to midnight, seven days a week. Um, and there's arguments to be made that, um, I've heard a lot of arguments that that work culture is part of the reason why China is succeeding. Um, Norman, you know, having worked in both spaces, can you talk a little bit about what's the Silicon Valley view on that 996 work culture and well, how would you uh, react to that? In a lot of cases, I think what we're seeing is that we're seeing that China leads the West in certain ways, but the East also, uh, but the West leads the East. This changing philosophy is always at odds with one another. And so in Silicon Valley, as we've started now, we've got platforms that have now reached their maturities. Like companies like Google are now in their 20th year, right? It's been around for 20 years as a company, right? So, but in China, everything's can, every. China's growth has been the last 20 years. And in the last 20 years, you've had to create almost everything from the ground up. And so in creating everything from the ground up, China's challenge is how do you embrace this idea of in, and reward this idea of individual success? Many of these founders, they're not replaceable. They are truly, truly gifted. I've worked with some of the best in China. They are truly, truly exceptional. But the moment that stands out for me is that this is the year that Jack Ma retired. This is the year that he literally stepped away, walked away, and said, you know what? Someone else is running this. I'm not even chairman. I'm, I'm just a shareholder now. But for the workers, it's a different story. For the workers, for the team, the story of burnout is real. I was hiring 17 people a day. And of those 17 people a day, three were going to be there a year later. So this idea of like this infinite supply of labor, 
is one of those things. And so what's driven and what's rewarded in China isn't progress, it's fear. Whereas here in Silicon Valley, we don't ever think about fear. You get put on a pip. Does anybody know what a pip is? <laughs> Big does. You, you didn't meet your OKR. <laughs> For those that don't know, like <laughs> a pip is a performance improvement plan, and an OKR is, is objectives and key results. The idea of objectives and key results is a measurement that is a measurement that John Doerr, one of the founders of Kleiner Perkins, has been really talking about, which is that everybody should have an objective. They should understand the overall objectives of the company, and then it rolls down to the individual objectives. And then you should have like your own set of key results, and those key results continue to roll up through the various levels of the organization. But in Silicon Valley, there's always multiple strikes. There's multiple chances. There's multiple ways to adjust and course correct. But China's mentality, there's, no, there's nothing left. This Taoist mentality of we must win. That's what creates the 996. And so Mike Moritz says that in Silicon Valley, we're getting lazy. We're not hungry enough. We're not creating enough unicorns. Look at China. They've got more unicorns created in the last three years than Silicon Valley has. And so it becomes a race. At what point should it not be a race? And at what point should it be more about, as an individual, within a company, or with a company, what are we going to do to be the change that lasts? So you know, the, having said that, um, you're an investor in China companies. And as an investor, you want these companies to succeed. How do you speak to them both about um, success? You know, how, how do you like? Calm them down. Like they're in an environment that's like boiling all the time, high pressure. Everybody around them is doing the 996. What do you say to them to get them to embrace this idea of sustainability in themselves? It's a great question. A lot of what this is is about unplugging. One of the things we did as an executive team with our company in China, before we became a unicorn, we said, what are we going to do? Every year, we take two weeks and the executive team and a bunch of team members, we'd go on a bike ride. We rode 150 kilometers together. We were on the road together. No phones, no internet, because the internet works great in Beijing, but when you're going 150 kilometers outside of Beijing, the internet doesn't work that well. So we unplugged. And we said, find those things, find the take advantage of creating these retreats. And that's the same thing we're seeing here in Silicon Valley. We're starting to create these retreats. So Norman, when you were like cycling around Beijing, what were your competitors doing? Uh, trying to catch up, <laughs> right? We had the advantage. We were, we were the lead, right? We were the leading mobile company in China. But you know what? We said, at the end of the day, our growth is good enough. We will get there. We're not one day off. Taking one day off never killed a company. Taking one week off never killed a company. And taking one month off never killed a company. Taking one year off doesn't kill the company. Maybe. <laughs> um, so um, what I'm hearing from this panel is that um, growth is not the only value. Um, and that's really what sustainable innovation is all about. What are your values and principles in life? Um, it reminds me of this quote. I can't remember who said it, but um, growth for growth's sake is the ideology of the cancer cell. Um, why grow infinitely? Um, that is really what cancer is, right? Um, so I'd like to, before I flip it over to the audience and start grilling everybody here, um, <laughs> ask a, said one last question to our panelists, uh, which is, um, what are your values in life, and how does that drive um, sustainability for you and your organization? Uh, Paul, if you could. You should have primed us with that one. That's a deep question. Um, values in life. Um, you know, I, I think like doing things that are inherently challenging is just, just inherently enjoyable, OK? And with challenge comes stress. And so I don't think there's any avoiding it. Like, honestly, I think that's like a key part of living a meaningful uh, life is to have like some degree of like a lot of challenges and a lot of like 
um, and overcoming that and then feeling great about it and then moving on to the next challenge. So I don't think the key is to have, like, to avoid challenges by any stretch, but just basically being, having that self-awareness that when you are burning out, maybe just, like, take your foot off the pedal a little bit. Um, I, I think kind of as a person not living in Silicon Valley, I uh, find this discussion quite interesting because we don't seem to uh, fundamentally question why growth? Um, and is growth just to outpace China? And what's, so what if you outpace China? And, and then what, right? So, and, and these are questions. I mean, I don't have answers for them. But I think I, uh, because I work in kind of social businesses and we talk a lot about reimagining what a different system could look like. Um, I like the CEO of Patagonia who actually talks a, a lot about this year, a uh, different kind of capitalism. In America, you have quarterly reporting that drives companies to a certain behavior that they just have to look very short term and is extremely competitive. Whereas I think other countries are uh, more catching up with a different kind of a, a tweak to how capitalism currently works. And, and it, I think it does feed into our conversations about personal sustainability because if the system does not change, there's only uh, a limit to how much a person can change themselves. But I think the values I, um, I have as a person are very much thinking about um, the kind of world I want to leave behind. I mean, I might be too young to be thinking about what happens when I retire on my deathbed, but I do think about that because I, I think all of us have a responsibility uh, to our next generation um, in whatever deeds we do. Um, so my values are very much the integrity um, and the responsibility I have as a leader. Um, and I, I also have moved away from defining myself uh, from what I do and maybe the achievements I have. I think when I started my social entrepreneurship journey from 2013 onwards, uh, actually until 2017, I've been very caught up with just working extremely hard and trying to prove myself and trying to define and getting satisfaction from the things I do. I think now I've moved on to a stage, and it, it makes me sound quite old, but I, I think it, I, I'm more in a stage now where I just want to be, and I define myself really by the values I impart to the world, not by the things I do. Uh, and I think that kind of takes the, the stress out. I mean, I still have stress, but the, it's the right level of stress to push me to, to challenge and to innovate, but not the kind of stress that makes me uh, unable to be the best self. Um, and I, I would challenge perhaps, especially people in the Valley, um, the kind of uh, way you network or present yourself to each other. And you know, this sound a bit like preaching, but it does set, seem that there's a lot of focus on the credentials and not enough on, on the values that we have. And could we actually connect more on a personal level and the values that we can share with each other? Great. Uh, I Thanks. Thank <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time thinking about this this year. And a, a good chunk of that, the first thing is purpose. Before, if you asked me what I did, it was to use the internet to connect people in different ways. But my purpose has evolved beyond that. That's a tool. That's a thing I did to allow me to do other things, to create more systematic change. And why? Well, then it goes down to values. I want to create equal opportunity for everybody. I don't want any minority to face any discrimination, whether it be because of age, because of sex, because of race, because of sexual orientation. There should be equal opportunity for everyone. So those values then drive the last thing, which is community. So, the last thing I pick are communities I want to be a part of. Because being in part and involved of like-minded people is the one thing that drives us. We, as human beings, we're social beings. We're not designed to be lone wolves, or we're not meant to be existing in these individual, individual towers. Like, that's not what we're designed for. And so in this world of remote cultures, we've got so many people that are building this. And people don't have physical touch points. They don't have physical community. You have to have that, because physical community, what reminds you 
of the purpose and the values. And that's what gives you the energy to go on. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'd like to warn Suhani, Lisa, and Karen that I'm going to be asking you guys a couple of questions in a bit. Um, before we get into that, though, what questions do you guys have for our panelists? Or actually, um, who's experienced burnout in their professional careers? Pretty good chunk of the room. Um, should be 70%. Should be more. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I think it's more. <laughs> uh, but I think it's something that um, even in groups of very successful people, uh, there's, a, I, there's a tendency to sort of um, tell each other uh, that, you know, we're crushing it, we're doing so well. Uh, but one thing I like about having spent some time with the age of 21 community is like being able to be more vulnerable with each other, being able to support each other um, in different ways, not just in the direct professional, like how can we help each other's organizations kind of way, but uh, in a more personal kind of way. So I'm glad to have this space uh, to be able to just start this kind of conversation between us. Um, and I think Bing had a question. Uh, thank you, Uncle Norm, for being here with us. Uh, <laughs> For those that don't know, Bing calls me Uncle Norm. It's respect. Um, this is a very simple, non-qualitative question. Um, uh, you all mentioned like meditation, breathing, all that sort of thing. I'm wondering if you speak very specifically to very specific tools that you use. So if you meditate, what app is the best? If you go on silent retreats, which retreat is the best? Uh, so forth and so on. I'll start with what I normally do. Um, how many people have been in a float tank? Does anybody know what a float tank is? What's a float tank, Norman? Do you want to explain? Um, so it's a capsule where you can basically shut yourself off, float within it. Um, it's usually high in, in salt and you just relax. For those that don't know, a float tank is a sensory deprivation tank. It's a, literally, it is just go into a chamber filled with salt water. And it's just you, your thoughts, just floating in this. And this is supposed to mimic, um, mimic your neutral state, which is, you know, when you're an embryonic form, this is how you develop in, uh, as a fetus. And this is meant to basically bring you back to your basics. Sometimes I do it for an hour, sometimes I do it for two hours. It's a long time. At the end of an hour and 45 minutes, I'm like, am I supposed to get out yet? <laughs> and I wait for that signal and that chime that says to come out. But that sensory deprivation tank, that is my way of isolation. That is literally my way of being completely unplugged. And it's an extreme form of meditation. The, the whole idea of this is for you to float in between states of consciousness. Um, and so if you get a chance to try it, it's totally worth it. Uh, I did it just recently in Ubud, uh, you know, when I was traveling with my family in Indonesia, uh, in Bali. And it's, you know, they're, they're now existing around the world. And I highly, highly encourage everybody to try. I just Googled it. The closest one is two train stops away. Uh, Insight Float in San Carlos, if anyone wants to take a field trip. By the way, you get a discount code if you tell them I sent you. Free float. This discount. Um, I, I started running. Um, so I kind of had a crash in 2017. My back was hurting. Like my whole body was like falling apart. I'm like... I'm, in my mid twenties, I'm behaving like an old person. So I just made that uh, point to really exercise, um, and it chimes in with the philosophy that I hear from mentors, which is entrepreneurship. Building a company is really not a sprint; it's a marathon. So I decided to go and try to run a half marathon, um, only half, not yet a marathon. But um, I being able to run, and for me, being with nature and I think you shouldn't ask about what apps you use because you should just be with yourself and be okay with leaving behind any machines. Um, and yeah, really just be with your thoughts uh, and be alone. So running allows me to do that. I also like being with the water, but I'm not very fortunate now to be, well, living by the sea, so I don't get to do that, but I would definitely try float tank the next time. Doesn't need to be by a sea. It's like literally a room. <laughs> It would be nice. I, I'm a bit claustrophobic, so <laughs> I, I don't know how that well, would land, but it would be nice to flow by the sea. Yeah. 
So, and actually, how many people in the room actually meditate or have a practice? Is it, it seems like probably, yeah, about half. Um, I think we're quite lucky in the Bay Area. There's obviously just some world-class places. Um, the place I, I'd recommend is Spirit Rock. Um, they do a really um, just very professional, um, you know, three-day, seven-day, ten-day, or even three-month silent retreat. Um, and it's, 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 it's slightly, like, you know, focused on Buddhism, but it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite, you know, secular, which is... Uh, if you know if you're interested in that, um, the, another another thing that I have picked up more recently is um, is ocean swimming. I find that actually just exposing your code, your your body to um, cold uh, kind of clear for me at least clears my mind. Like the, it's like, and it doesn't it doesn't take long. It only takes a few you know, like maybe like 15 minutes of getting out there, um, and then the endorphins start kicking in, and it's just like an incredible experience. So, would recommend that as well. Great. I think Prakshan had a question. Would you like to? Uh, uh, thanks so much for uh, the, uh, your uh, perception. Uh, I'm general from China, and so around my own startup. So first of all, I want to uh, make some explanation to uh, to you guys. So so we talk a lot about line and six. Um, so I do agree with uh, Lomen's uh, uh, point. So for big firms like Alibaba, is uh, absolutely there's a low point to to for, uh, to do that because like the most of the like the employees right that over thirty. Right, they have a kid. To, they have to take care of the family. But on, uh, on on the other hand, for many startups, uh, for example, my own start startup. So because we're fighting with the big firms, if don't if don't work hard, for, if don't work for more, the put more effort, put more more time, right, on your work. I don't think we don't have we don't think we have any chance to to win, right. Um, so uh, I think also in China there uh, there. Uh, the uh, landscape of tech, tech firms is also uh, very complicated, right? So even like the working uh, culture uh, between Tencent and Baba is quite different. So I think we, we can't uh, just reach a very uh, general uh, conclusion on that. Yeah, uh, this is my point. Uh, secondly, um, this, uh, uh, this question goes to Stephanie. So uh, uh, in, in the past few years, one and more uh, young uh, Enterprises who used to start in in US are moving back to like Southeast Asia, like the fund of a, uh, fund of a Grab and all, all this this kind of persons. So because like the startup culture in uh, in Southeast Asia is still at very early stage. So so uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of your case, uh, so how do you ha- uh, I don't adjust or handle this kind of like uh, like uh, like hiring and also yeah. this kind of things. Thank you. I can add, add one sort of point yeah. there, which is that for me as a leader, you know, what I spent my time teaching my teams was how to work smarter, not harder. Um, the whole idea of working smarter was really understanding not what the answer was, but how do we understand you know, this goal that, or purpose that we're working towards. And this is very, very different because the Taoist philosophy is win at all costs, right? This is, not, this is not exist and just be. This is literally win or die, right? I either win or I lose. No middle ground. And so I think that that mindset change is what's needed at the leadership level, especially with teams in China, to continue to keep the team going. Yes, there is this idea of assigning tasks, and yes, there is this idea of you have this job, but my advice is always, and perspective was, what was more effective was to take people out of that box and have people understand the organization as a whole, uh, and take a little bit more, or employ a little bit more of a Western methodology, where when we sat in rooms, they were preparing, they were talking about the topics, I was not driving the agenda. So coming to the um, question about uh, kind of returnee entrepreneurs, I think people are starting to like use the phrase sea turtles. Uh, it might start catching on. Um, the first company I started uh, when I was still in college, we raised funding. And uh, it was super thrilling because we thought that raising funding was um, a, a big milestone. And what we didn't realize, it was more of a, a, a weight on us. Like We really had to, like now we'd promised somebody who'd given, given us $200,000 um, that we would grow like, um, 100% per week for the next like 50 weeks. So this is uh, it was I was working um, like 
Paul said earlier, just like 100 hours a week. I really felt him when he said that, like waking up, like grinding your teeth in the middle of the night because um, these targets are insane. Um, and then um, that startup failed, totally failed, because we were dumb and we were 21. Um, the, not all 21s are that dumb. Um, the second company I joined, uh, the I joined as employee number 12, and we took two rounds of venture funding, uh, and then we had like pretty much just like the best possible story, right? Uh, grew from 12 people to 400 people. Google acquired us for $350 million. Awesome, rested, invested at Google for a year. And then I went back to the Philippines to start a business there. And having experienced the venture capital like cycle, um, I very deliberately have chosen not to raise funding for the startup I'm running now. We still work crazy hard. I think that it is important sometimes, like you really just have to work hard to win. But what I don't want to do is to force my team to work hard in a nonstop way without clear objectives um, in like it's time frames that they can see, like four weeks, six week sprints to hit very specific goals where we're all working together like 80 hours a week is all right um, and is I think still possible to do in a sustainable way, uh, but not working 100 hours a week with no end in sight to hit venture capital, um, like 100% per week growth goals. Um, so that's kind of how I'm managing uh, my team right now and how we think about success. Um, so we have about eight minutes left. I, I really would like to ask, start asking some questions to the audience, um, especially people who are not quite, um, who have to work like absurdly hard and innovate, but not in the tech venture capital space. So is Dr. Lin here? I was trying to spot her. Dr. Lisa? No? All right, all right, maybe she's just hiding from me. Um, so if you guys see her later, um, she is a, uh, she's a professor of medicine, a medical doctor, and has worked a lot with Ebola, which I find fascinating. So please do ask her about what it means to be sustainable in a place where like, people are literally dying in pandemics. Um, is Karen, I, I see Karen. Karen, could you, do you wanna to speak to this a little bit? Uh, we've had conversation about this. Um, so Karen is a, um, uh, a smart cities, um, what, what is your exact title? Um, is the, sorry, like head of, head of smart cities for North America for Singapore, is that, uh, is that right? Um, and somebody who's very interested as an executive coach in how to uh, handle mental health um, in high achievement cultures. So could you speak a bit to your reactions to this panel? Thanks, Steph, and you're definitely coming back at me for what I did two days ago to you. Yes, <laughs> I called her <laughs> to speak at a, when I was a moderator. Um, so I'm Karen. I, I've been kind of a serial uh, like entrepreneur in the Singapore government. I look back at, at my last maybe eight years in the government, and I, I basically set up five different teams. Um, my latest ones were in the U.S. Um, you know, I really liked what you said, Bonnie, about, you know, leading from who you are. I think I came to this point where I was just doing and doing and doing a lot. And, and I, in my professional life, I could hold like four or five jobs at any one time. But in my personal life, what I really cared about was, was you know, the lack of relationships and connection that I was noticing in myself and, and in my peers. You know, as we would go out and try to be superstars in our field, we, we were not really connecting anymore. And that's an incredible source of... Uh, of loneliness and you know what you say when we go around the valley we say oh what do we do you know why, how cool we are and look all these people are asking us to speak on panels and just fundamentally felt very very empty uh, I, I gave a lot of thought about it to me I wanted to 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 be a bit of a safe haven to other people um, that I was coming across and and that's when I started getting training as an executive coach really you know showing radical empathy to people who just need to be listened to well and ask more questions about them, about where they came from and who they are and, and clarifying their values. And that's a personal path that I took. And I think that's been incredibly transformative for me as a parent as well. You know, instead of always telling my kids, do this and do that, if not, you will fail. <coughs> you know, like really trying to understand, you know, what's driving them and helping them unpack that for themselves. So that's my own personal journey and radical empathy, radical hospitality, inviting people who are not like myself into my own home, uh, hosting people if they don't have places to stay. You know, I think those are things that I cultivate. And in order to do that, you need some slack in your life. So I've really cut down also. Um, the, you know, I don't take like 10 meetings a day anymore. 
maybe do four or five and have that slack because when people need you, they need you. Uh, they need you at the time they need you, not when you can schedule them three months later. Uh, and that applies to your kids, that applies to your friends, that applies to people you work with. And now that I manage a team across London and the whole US, um, East Coast, West Coast, London, um, I realize like, I need to be available. So like that discipline of having slack in your life is important as you become a, a leader. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you, Karen. Kind of picking up on that, I have a question for the audience, right? Um, as leaders and managers, um, can anybody speak to a time when uh, they had to coach or manage someone through them burning out as somebody on your team um, kind of spiraling downhill? I'll bring it up. You know, work harder. I know the Asian parent in me would tell them like, no, you just work harder, suck it up. But no, uh, the reality is I've had you know times where I've had to take founders out and literally explain to them that you know, hey, we're on, we're not on the right path. That in this path, at the end of the day, the job as an investor is to reward value. And when value is not being created, you have to recognize the root cause. And sometimes that means recognizing that the root cause is that the leader is focusing on the wrong things. And so people are afraid sometimes of venture capital because people think, you know, hey, I'm going to take venture capital. And then at some point, this company's not going to work. And then I'm going to get taken out. I'm not, this is no longer my company. They're afraid of giving up that control. What it is is no, let's take a walk and let's talk about the values. Let's talk about the fundamentals. Let's talk about what is this company about? What does it mean to you? And what is the best path forward? And so sometimes that means taking them out for a day. Sometimes that means taking them out for half a day. Sometimes it just means taking them out for an hour. But it is important to recognize that and to recognize when you start to see that I started to train myself to see that when the founder starts focusing on the wrong things and the wrong metrics, it's my job not to, not to replace them, it's my job to guide them. Because I became a VC because I became a VC because I wanted to understand as an investor what it meant to be a better partner for founders and entrepreneurs. Cool. So I think we have one minute left. If anybody has like one burning question, there are two burning questions. If you could both ask your questions, and I think that uh, we can take a crack at both probably. Hi, thanks. Um, so I'm from Nepal, and we have China in the north and India in the south. So talk about peer pressure, right? Peer pressure. So it's it's not like <laughs> so it's not like an individual burnout, but it's a national burnout. Oh <laughs> So, um, and we've been talking so much about the bubble in the Silicon Valley in China and um, uh, unicorns, but I want to know your perspective on, um, speaking of national burnout and stuff, there's no we can compete with China and India on um, creating unicorns per se, right? But we, I see a rise of uh, this wave of uh, small entrepreneurs and that go, that aren't, uh, unicorns, but maybe phoenixes, you know, they're like phoenix. So what's your perspective on nurturing um, a, a, a company or startup or uh, the mentality of being more of a phoenix than, and going beyond just being the unicorn? Especially for regions question. that are outside the, uh, the Silicon Valley in China, but still being globally relevant in terms of innovation and being future forward. Awesome. Um, can we get the second question now yeah, before so, we... Um, not a question, but a response to your question about uh, having worked with someone in the team when they were facing burnout. And I think uh, just looking back, uh, I had a conversation with a potential investor a few months ago, and uh, I projected my role as being more of that as a coach uh, alongside leading the team. Um, and I think what you do find when you're running a company is that uh, your goal is essentially to align the company's your vision with the company's mission uh, and with essentially the mission of each employee so that everyone's aligned towards achieving that goal. Sometimes when you achieve that alignment, uh, many people who are working with you end up giving more than they can sustain uh, to their job. And quite often there are people who are aligned to, an, to the extent and if others aren't, um, the situation gets created where they start, start doing everyone else's work as well because they're really aligned to achieving that output and that outcome, right? And so 
the conversations that I've typically had is about playing the long game, uh, about sustainability and surviving, and it's not just surviving, but in order to thrive, you have to give yourself a break and not take on everyone else's work. Uh, I just thought I'd share that, that, that that's essentially the approach that I've had to take and coach people uh, because even when there is alignment, and getting alignment is not easy, but even when there's alignment, there are challenges there that people get over overcommitted in a sense. Thank you, Nikhil. Um, Brian, do you want to take a first crack at the Phoenix question? Yeah, you so coined you here first, by the way. You heard it here, everybody. Has everyone heard of zebras? Like as a counter movement to unicorns? Zebras. Zebras. Yeah, zebras. zebras. Oh my God. No. Um, oh my God. Um, we need to bring that to Silicon Valley then. So zebras are a well counter movement really to unicorns. Um, so that uh, well, one thing about zebras is black and white. Actually, some parliaments have like the zebra quota, so male, women kind of balance. Um, so part of Zebras are uh, female entrepreneurs coming to say the unicorns don't work for us. It's not sustainable. It's not the kind of world we want to live in. So Zebras are about reimagining what good companies actually look like um, and cho choosing Zebras because the colors represent gender balance, but also just a funky icon to replace unicorns or, or sit alongside unicorns. So I, I think there's a lot of movement like um, where there's the zebras or the B Corps, which is a certification for companies that um, value both financial and social and, and environmental returns, um, or simply companies that decide not to raise investment. I mean, like Stephanie, like just uh, deciding consciously, I am going to build a company in a different way. Uh, so I think once we expand our horizons, we'll be able to see all these things that are going on in different parts of the world and align ourselves to which ones, those values, those visions resonate the most with us and then be part of that. Any other burning comments as we close this out? I'll add one last thing, which is I think it starts with, there's a fine line between challenge and compassion. And that line of challenge says that your job is to educate about a broader perspective, to bring new knowledge to the table, to listen, acknowledge, and identify how does this other person see this thing, and how can we bring an additional outside lens to that. Compassion is how you deliver it. You need to deliver it with care. You can't deliver it and be combative. No one's going to listen to you if you're approaching this thing without that, without that air of care. So in order to keep them going forward, you know, I think it's really your job to sort of walk that fine line, to bring additional perspective to them, to say, let me show you the broader market. Let me show you the broader, let me show you the world at hand beyond uh, these borders. And then it's, let me show you care. How can I help? Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panelists and our audience for this conversation about values.